Well, hey, hey, I think this thing is on. How's it going, everyone? Welcome to Learn Live TV. Hope everyone's having a great day. My name is Andy Sirwich, and uh, with me, I got a good friend, Carson Rockfall. How's it going, my friend? Hi, Andy. Uh, nice to meet you again and uh, being here live on Learn Live uh, and with a great topic today, right? It's Definitely. one of our favorites, uh, Hyper-V, Storage Spaces, Direct, Azure Stack HCI, and ev everything of the good stuff. Definitely, definitely. So we got a really jam-packed session here. I'm really excited about this one, not only because it's, you know, learn live TV, but like you said, it's a great topic, right? You know, and really that topic being, like you said, uh, Storage Spaces Direct, Hyper-V, and really those core components of Azure Stack HCI, right, is really what we're talking about today. And um, I guess before we get into that, maybe we should do just a quick introduction of ourselves, just so people know who these two talking heads are, right? Um, so I, I guess I'll start with myself. So again, my name is Andy Sirwich. Uh, I'm a technical evangelist for a company called Hornet Security. Uh, I'm also a Microsoft MVP in the Cloud and Data Center Management Competency. Um, you know, if you have any follow up questions, you just want to say, hey, um, I am pretty active out on Twitter. My apologies. You'll have to spell the last name. So that's my Twitter handle there in the bottom right hand corner. You know, I have a friend that says I should change my Twitter handle to uh, at Andy Sandwich because that's what they called me in elementary school. <laughs> but uh, um, I haven't quite gotten there yet. So uh, but Carson, how about you tell us about yourself before we uh yeah, dive into of this. course. My my name is Carsten Rachfall. As uh, it's it's a bit hard because I'm from Germany and we pronounce some hard uh, letters there. So I'm also in uh, cloud and data center management MVP as you are, Andy. And uh, I'm so fortunate. I'm also an Azure MVP. So uh, I'm a hybrid MVP in in the sense of having two. Uh, to uh, specialties, the cloud and on-premises. And uh, to, but to be honest, I'm still an on-premise guy. Uh, I'm now an MVP for 11 years, and I hope I get my 12th award uh, in summer. So we will see. I'm sitting here in my cavern, as you may be see. <laughs> I'm I'm on holiday, and you are sitting at the east coast of the US. So how, how what time is it there, Andy? <laughs> Well, it is uh, 4.30 a.m. And uh, just just to make sure I wasn't blurry-eyed and groggy when I got on, I actually woke up at 2 a.m. But I went to bed at 8 uh, p.m. last night. And, you know, I it's Learn Live TV. Like, it's such it's a live. great platform that I just... I didn't care what time of day it was. So I'm just happy to be here and talk about this great technology. And uh, um, Carson, it's great to have you on again. And we're kind of the dynamic duo of Azure Stack HCI core technologies today. So yeah, it's like a deja vu. We had, a, we had a webinar, I think, three weeks ago about uh, a similar topic. We did, yeah. Not but now we are live at Microsoft. So let's get started because we have a lot of stuff to talk about, right? We do. Yes, definitely. So this session is designed to kind of cover the module that you can see at the URL here, the aka.ms link, um, or you can just scan the QR code as well. So again, we're going to be covering the same material that's in this module. Uh, so feel free to, to follow along um, and we'll be sure to uh, not only cover the information in that module, but also kind of share some interesting stories, some tidbits, and some inf interesting information along the way. So the other thing I wanted to do is we've introduced ourselves, but everybody say hi to Flo Fox, our moderator as well. So um, Flo's going to be kind of keeping track of the comments. Uh, might be passing through some stuff for us to take a look at. Um, just an all-around great guy. I, In fact, I owe Flo an email. <laughs> he emailed me a couple <laughs> of days ago, and I haven't gotten back to him yet. But... Um, <laughs> Flo, I owe you an email, so as I'll be sure to get back to you on that, uh, hopefully later today sometime, assuming I'm awake, right? So everybody say hi to Flo. Uh, he's going to be helping us out in the chat today. Now, again, like I mentioned uh, on the title slide there, um, we're going to be covering the material that is presented in this Microsoft Learn module on Introduction to Azure Stack HCI Core Technologies. And again, if you haven't made it over to that URL yet, it's right there, or you can scan the QR code for more information. Now, 
Karsten mentioned this. We are live. This is a live event. So we're not just uh, two recorded talking heads. We're two live talking heads, right? So go ahead and say hi in the chat. So we're going to do our best to make sure we get your questions answered and interact with you. And uh, yeah, we love being live. I, I don't know about you, Karsten. I love live events just because it's like, you know, it's, these, it's are, not... these are the good ones. I, I, I hate recording. So I'm, I'm, I'm getting so... Uh, so picky when I record something. So a fi uh, uh, 15 minutes of recording takes me maybe four to eight hours to do them oh, because yeah. I'm always we do them. But no, uh, let's go on. Maybe we have even some demos. We will see how we go, how we are with time. So yeah, dive definitely. into our topic: learn objectivities. Yeah. So the learning objectives for this particular module. Again, following along with the module that we linked to. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to talk about Hyper V and its components because. Um, at a core level, Hyper-V is super critical to Azure Stack HCI, and it enables a lot of the features that Azure Stack HCI brings to the table. And then we're going to talk about Azure Stack HCI itself and its various components. And then we'll get into software-defined storage, which you know, Carson's going to take us through Storage Spaces Direct and all of the uh, considerations and things to, to worry about with that. And he's also going to take us through software-defined networking. So everything in the SDN stack inside of uh, Azure Stack HCI, there's a lot to digest in those two sections. So again, we're just going to kind of continue right on here. So again, going through this module, just kind of as a, a starting point, um, you know, before you really start to on your Azure Stack HCI journey and understand where it works, where it fits, you know, what, what's, uh, what environments would you install it in? You really have to understand all of the components under the hood, right? And that's what we're going to be covering in this particular session today. Now, starting with, what is Hyper-V? Now, uh, Hyper-V is a feature that's near and dear to me. I shouldn't say feature, it's a role in Windows Server. Um, but it's a role in Windows Server that is near and dear to me. I, if I go way back in my MVP days, I was originally a Hyper-V MVP. Um, before they kind of rolled that up into the cloud and data center management competency. So I could, I could talk about Hyper-V all day, So, uh, but we have a lot of other stuff to cover, so we'll be sure to, to continue on here. So again, starting with those core technologies in Azure Stack HCI, what is Hyper-V? So that's the first thing that we're going to cover here. And the thing with Hyper-V is it is the core virtualization technology inside of Windows Server and inside of Azure Stack HCI. So that is the role in Windows Server and Azure Stack HCI that allows you to spin up virtual machines and present them to your network so your, uh, you know, your end users can consume those services. And if you're not 100% familiar with virtualization, basically what Hyper-V and hypervisors are allowing us to do is to take a physical server, install the hypervisor on top of it. What the hypervisor does is it allows us to take the, the host resources, the resources from the physical machine and carve them off into separate virtual machines. So a little bit of a history lesson here. If we go all the way back to like the days of, you know, physical servers. Um, I actually remember those days, and I'm sure you do as well, Karsten. Um, there was a point in time where you'd have a whole server rack full of servers, and this physical server was your file server, and this physical server was your web server. And the problem with that model was, you know, you might be using 10% of that server's resources, and the other 90% was completely wasted, right? Um, so the problem with that is, is especially your bean counters, your accountants, they'll look at that and that's not an effective use of company resources, right? So what you know, software vendors did was create hypervisors that allow us to more uh, efficiently make use of all these resources. So now you'll have a physical server that's running uh, four, five, 20, 30, 50 virtual machines, whatever it can handle. And now maybe that physical server is more like, you know, 60 to 70 percent utilized instead of 10 percent, and that's really what uh, uh, virtualization and, and hypervisors. That's the problem that they have solved for us. But that brought a lot of other advantages along the way as well, which we'll talk about here in the uh, in, in the rest of the session here. Now, Hyper-V specifically is Microsoft's implementation of a hypervisor, and um, like I said already, it's it's available as a role on top of Windows Server. It's available on Azure Stack HCI. Um, 
There is also a free product out there called Microsoft Hyper-V Server. Um, it's available in uh, Windows Server 2019. That product has actually been uh, discontinued. They're not going to continue uh, with new versions of that. That said, the 2019 version of Hyper-V Server will be supported until, what is it, Karsten? I always forget. It's like 2028? 20, 2029. 20, 20, so 20, 20, uh, at, at 10 years. So it, it came out in 2019. So 2029, uh, still a long way to go, right? Definitely, definitely. So it's going to be supported for a long while yet. And uh, Hyper-V Server, again, that free SKU is is great if you just want to like kick the tires on, on Hyper-V and just play with it. Um, it's fantastic for that. The other thing that's worth mentioning here is that Hyper-V is available on 64-bit uh, uh, versions of the Windows client OS. So mm -hmm. uh, Windows 10, Windows 11. So you can run that uh, on top of client OS. It, it's fantastic for test dev. Um, I've been known to have a, a virtual machine running on top of my Windows client OS at any given time. Uh, right now, I've got two running on my laptop that's actually supporting my lab environment. That's a whole nother story. But Hyper-V, again, that core hypervisor role inside of the uh, Windows Server stack, including on Azure Stack HCI. So what does the architecture of Hyper-V look like? And that's what this slide really covers. We have a nice diagram here on the right-hand side of, of how that architecture looks. And we've got at the base layer at the very bottom, we've got your hardware. That's your CPU, your memory, networking storage is, is your hardware, right? And what a lot of people uh, don't know in terms of Hyper-V, this is always kind of an interesting tidbit I share whenever I'm, I'm talking about this topic is when you install the Hyper-V role on uh, client OS or Windows Server or wherever, what, uh, what server is actually doing in the background is it's actually virtualizing that root operating system. It's almost like a, a hidden VM. So it almost like virtualizes uh, the, the host operating system. So that's why you see this root OS on the left-hand side. It's, it's kind of like a virtual machine. You can't see it or interact with it in, in Hyper-V in any way, shape, or form, but that's the host operating system. And then using the hypervisor, you can spin up additional virtual machines. That's where you see on the right-hand side here, the guest OS. So you'll hear that term uh, used all throughout Microsoft's terminology uh, when we're talking about Hyper-V and virtual machines. So guest OS, guest VM, these are just some terms that you can kind of think of as virtual machines. They're interchangeable, those terms really. So you'll see the guest OS over here. And in this diagram, you really only see a single guest OS, but you could have, like I said earlier, you could have 5, 10, 50, 100, whatever your hardware could accommodate uh, at that hardware layer. You could run all kinds of different uh, virtual machines on top of that hardware. Now, we're going to make things a little more complicated now. We also have this concept in... Uh, the Microsoft world, uh, or just virtualization in general, there's this concept of uh, nested virtualization, right? And if you guys have ever seen that movie Inception, right? <laughs> this, uh, the, the whole premise of Inception is a dream inside of a dream inside of a dream, right? <laughs> That's kind of what nested virtualization is. So it's like, I'm going to run a hypervisor on my hardware, and then I'm going to spin up a virtual machine that I'm going to install a hypervisor in, and run virtual machines in there. And it, it sounds really complicated. After you've done it a few times, it's not too bad. But the question that always comes up when I'm having this particular conversation about nested virtualization is like, why would I want to do that, Andy? Right? <laughs> why would I want to run nested virtualization? And what I always come up with is test dev. Um, now, I'm going to make a little bit of a joke here at, at, at your expense, Carson. But... If you, <laughs> unless your name is Carson Rock, do it. Here we go. So unless your name is Carson Rockfall, you probably don't have a lot of hardware lying around to, to test virtualization workloads on, right? I I guess that wasn't really a joke at your expense, Carson. It was no, just no, it's a, okay. Just a, uh, an observation that you always have the most awesome hardware to work with in your lab. I'm I'm a little bit jealous, I have to say. Yeah. But it's, <laughs> so Andy, but uh, I, I, I um, if I add to that, I, I use nested virtualization, even having a lot of hardware, I use it um, every other week. And uh, yeah. I would like to share that information when you're finished with this part and maybe do a short demo if I think we have time for that. But uh, what yeah, do you think? Yeah, that'd be great. That'd be yeah. great. Definitely. Yeah. So 
just real quick here, like, like you said, you still use it every other week. And again, that comes back to the question I asked of like, well, why, Andy? Why would I want to use nested virtualization? And when we're talking about Azure Stack HCI specifically, so let's let's assume you're watching this session because maybe you're in a place where you might have to, to implement it within your organization, right? And maybe you don't have, like I mentioned, maybe you don't have hardware lying around that you can spin up Azure Stack HCI on and, and test it out. So that's where nested virtualization comes in. You can get just a, a really beefy server or heck, I've seen people do this on laptops. Um, you can spin up a, a, a virtual machine in Microsoft Azure that has virtualization capabilities where you can carve off Azure Stack HCI VMs, which you can then cluster and run virtualized workloads on top of them, basically it allows you to kind of test out even these virtualization scenarios in a virtualized manner on the hardware that you have, right? And, and like you said, Carson, I think uh, you've got a demo over there, right? Um, yeah. That kind of shows this better than I can explain it, right? Um, yeah. So yeah, let me let me do that. So first, why do I knew, uh, why do I use uh, nested virtualization uh, a lot? Um, I, I I didn't talk about what what I'm doing uh, for for work. Uh, I, I I own my own company with my wife, uh, and we do uh, implementations of Hyper V storage bases direct and Azure Stack HCI. But I also do a lot of trainings, and I love when my trainees uh, can. Uh, have a real experience so they have hardware um, to work with and to go along with with the training so i use nested virtualization to deploy storage spaces direct clusters and azure stack hci clusters for my attendees and even if you try something out something new a new kubernetes uh, release azure kubernetes for azure stack hci or so you just can install some uh, virtual machines and uh, in the virtual machines, you build up Azure Stack HCI and play with all the cool stuff you have. And you don't have to install the hardware all the time. Or imagine I have a, a, train, a, a training course with 12 uh, attendees. I don't have 12, even 12 two-node uh, Azure Stack HCI host or even four-node. Right. Right. So what I prepared here in the demo, and I don't know, uh, uh, Laurent, maybe you can uh, give me a hands up if you can see my screen or otherwise I can zoom it a bit, but then um, the, the how you call it, the fonts are getting a little bit blurry. Where's my mouse? So I unzoom it. Um, here, what you see is the good old Hyper-V manager, and this is a tool we still use to manage, hi manage Hyper-V and also in Azure Stack HCI, we can use it. So I have here a four node uh, Azure Stack HCI cluster, one of my hardware clusters. And on one node, uh, here on the third node, I have deployed uh, three virtual machines. Yeah. So you see here, uh, one has a weird name. It's like Hallenberg uh, Windows 11 Multi-User 03. So that's an AVD VM, uh, something for another day. This is the start of the uh, Azure, uh, Azure Stack HCI uh, training courses. So we will not talk about that. But here we have two other machines, and these are storage bases direct nodes. And uh, these are running on this one hypervisor. Yeah. So if I go into this VM, here you see I'm in the VM on the node. Here you see uh, the two nodes. And in the VM, there are other VMs running. So this is nested virtualization. We have, we have a Hyper-V node with a VM on it in the VM. We have Hyper-V. I opened Hyper-V here, so I can do it bigger. You see it here. This is the Hyper-V manager. Uh, I'm here, and here you see there are five VMs running. So if I go to this benchmark VM, this is now a VM in a VM in... Uh, <laughs> is it in a VM? <laughs> I don't, I don't uh, know. At some, so at some point, is, you just lose track, right? <laughs> you, you lose, like, like, in the, like in the movie, right? You lose, where are we now? So this is in the VM and I can play around and I could add Hyper-V again. So I could enable the Hyper-V role again and put VMs in this VM. But of course, we lose a bit of performance. We lose a, a bit of uh, CPU performance and also storage performance. So don't overdo it, but it helps me a lot and a lot of people to play around with this with this more complex concepts like an Azure Stack HCI, you need a cluster, you need a domain controller and so on. So you need multiple 
uh, multiple machines and not many people have multiple machines laying around to play with. So if you have a beefy notebook, so I'm presenting here on my notebook, it's a, it's a six core notebook with a lot of, uh, uh, RAM, um, you can do a nested virtualization there. Yeah. Um, so here I could start the VM. You see it's running and uh, just to show a bit of the uh, of the concept. Yeah. So back back to you, Andy. Back to your slides. Yeah. Yeah. Sounds good. Yeah. It's yeah. I'm glad you. One of the things you mentioned is um, when you use nested virtualization to test and and you know demo some of these concepts right you don't have to take the time to set up the hardware right because i mean sometimes that's that's the part of deployment that takes the longest is getting the hardware racked and stacked and ready and connected and you know using nested virtualization in this fashion definitely helps with that so very cool so next on the list here Reasons for using Hyper-V, and we've kind of been talking about this a little bit um, already, but, you know, at its base level, it's used for running virtual machines, right? And, um, you know, that's some of the core functionality yeah. that provides inside of Azure Stack HCI. But more specifically, what are some reasons you might want to use Hyper-V and, and virtualization? Well, kind of the scenario I mentioned earlier today, right? To consolidate that server infrastructure. You think back to the old days, right, where we had racks and racks of physical servers, it was designed to consolidate these workloads into, you know, smaller clusters of physical servers, right? Um, we've talked about this several times already as well, provide an environment for test and dev. I use it for that almost on a daily basis sometimes, I think. Um, we've got, we use it for VDI workloads. So um, that stands for virtual desktop infrastructure, if uh, you guys aren't familiar with that particular acronym. So that'd be a situation where, like, you remember the old terminal server days, right? Where you'd have a physical, you know, a physical server, maybe uh, in the old days, that you would have a number of end users logging into using RDP to conduct their their work on a day to day basis, right? VDI allows them to log into more of a client operating system, and depending on the VDI deployment you do, there's a couple of different options. We'll be talking about that a little bit more later today. And then you can utilize it for private cloud deployments, like we're talking about with Azure Stack HCI. So, you know. Uh, it's a cloud world now, right? And you've got the Azure cloud, you've got um, a number of different vendor clouds, the clouds everywhere, right? And the concept of a private cloud is like, hey, I've got my own cloud and, and cloud contains all of those, those functions and that, that, that functionality that allowed me to uh, be agile, connect users to my workloads in a number of different ways. Um, and, you know, the new term, new-ish term, I guess I would say, is hybrid cloud, right? So hybrid cloud would be a combination of both on-premises workloads and public cloud workloads like in Azure. So, for example, you might be running an Azure Stack HCI cluster on-premises as your private cloud while utilizing resources in public Azure as your public cloud. And that kind of marrying the two, getting the two to work together is kind of um, that terminology of hybrid cloud yeah uh, andy uh, just let me add something because yeah, for ahead. us it's it's uh, it's super clear uh, but uh, maybe not for our audience azure and hyper-v hyper-v is the hypervisor of azure so if you talk about yep. hybrid cloud you you can uh, run the same vm in azure maybe you can download it somehow and run it on your private cloud on a, on a microsoft hypervisor or vice versa so there are some great opportunities to move your vms from on premises to the cloud for example, for a disaster recovery scenario, because we have the same hypervisor in essence. Uh, and yep. uh, we, we didn't mention that for, for us, for us Hyper-V guys, it's completely normal, but maybe right. not for the audience. So here we have a huge advantage with Hyper-V over maybe other uh, companies who don't have this, uh, this dual world concept like the public cloud and the private cloud. Yeah? Just wanted to add that. Yeah, no, that's definitely a good point. I mean, a real world use case. I just had this two days ago. So I've got my my lab here in the house that I run all my test dev stuff on. And I've been vacating that so I can reinstall a, uh, you know, the, the current version of Azure Stack HCI on it. And I wanted to keep my my domain controller around and not have to reprovision my domain. So I actually moved my DC up into Azure for the next week or two while I do all this on-premises work. So I have a site-to-site -site VPN between my uh, on-premises location to a VNet in Azure where that DC lives. And, you know, but my the only 
users in my house are uh, my wife and kid. Uh, they're none the wiser that they're now getting DNS from the uh, the domain controller in uh, in Azure as opposed to in my lab here on prem, right? <laughs> so just kind of a so um, Andy, just a short interruption. We have a question uh, from the audience. Uh, yeah. Uh, Evan wants to know, is there a security advantage by using Hyper-V? Uh, it's, a, it's a big one, right? It is. It is a big question. And the security advantage really is that um, you do maintain at the, the hypervisor layer, you think about the, the way that the, the Hyper-V works, right? And that slide I showed earlier, where you've got all the different guest operating system, the guest VMs. Hyper-V does maintain separation between the virtual machines, right? So you can't, um, you know, at the hypervisor layer, you can't bleed out and gain access from one VM to another without the proper authentication and that type of stuff. But uh, that's the one thing I always think of when it comes to, to security and Hyper-V is just how it maintains that separation of, of virtualization. Um, you think about another type of virtualization we have called application virtualization, which would be like your containerization. There's not as much separation there as you would get with virtual machines, but I'm kind of getting away from our topic. I, I don't uh, Karsten, is there something you want to add there on the, the security discussion? Yeah, the, Microsoft also uses the hypervisor for some Windows 10, Windows 11 yes, built in uh, security true. features like in, uh, in Edge. I always don't remember the correct word, but uh, that's this application... Ah, let, let me just click on Edge. We can... Um, yeah, I know the feature you're talking about because basically what it does is it spins up Edge inside of a like a hidden VM, VM, right? Yeah, like in the sandbox. So everything you do in the, VA, uh, in the browser can't affect your operating system because it's a read-only environment. Uh, uh, and there, there are other features, sandboxing, where it's used for the, a lot of security in Windows in Windows operating system uses the hyper hypervisor a bit. Uh, and this uh, this provides additional layers to security for our daily use, right? Right. And the thing I love but about on, that... Because we are a little bit... I think we are a little bit short on time already. We, have, we are nearly half an hour into, into the session. <laughs> you know, I, I could talk about this topic all day long. We can talk so, all yeah. day, yeah, yeah. Exactly. So, yeah, that's a good point. We'll, we'll, we'll continue on. So in terms of general features of Hyper-V, you know, uh, there's a number of different uh, bits and pieces inside of Hyper-V itself. So let's talk about management and connectivity first. You know, um, Karsten was showing Hyper-V Manager earlier, which is kind of like your de facto tool for using and interacting with Hyper-V. But we also have a number of other tools that you can use to uh, manage and interact with Hyper-V. You can use Windows Admin Center, which is the new web-based management tool in the uh, Microsoft ecosystem. You can certainly use PowerShell if you like to use PowerShell. And then you also have something in the System Center suite called System Center Virtual Machine Manager. Now... One of the other big features that Hyper-V brings to the table is portability. So you think about all those workloads we're running inside of virtual machines. Um, Hyper-V allows you to do things like live migration, storage migration. And you could also, like Karsten mentioned, uh, you know, moving workloads from on-prem into Azure, you have import-export functionalities as well. Now, I wanted to highlight live migration specifically. And I had to get the little dancing cat here because live migration is usually the one feature that uh, when people first start using Hyper-V, that's like, you know, that's the big aha moment. Live migration is a feature of Hyper-V that allows you to take a running virtual machine, keyword here, running virtual machine, and move it live from one piece of physical hardware to another. The VM doesn't go down. It stays live and running. The end users that are consuming the, 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 the applications from that server, they don't even know that the virtual machine has physically moved hardware. And what's great about this is like, you think about patching and downtime situations, maintenance. In the old days, we used to have to schedule downtime for two in the morning, right? And okay, take the server down, patch it, update it, bring it back up. Those days are kind of gone. If I have to patch a Hyper-V host inside of a cluster, um, or an Azure Stack HCI host, which we're talking about in this, this uh, particular session. I can simply move those virtual machines, patch the uh, the physical host that I'm working on, bring it back up, move the virtual machines back, do the next host, and just kind of go down the line. So live migration really enables a lot of, uh, uh, yeah. I guess, quality of life enhancements to the IT Pro. What do you think, Karsten? Yeah, 
and let's uh, let's add to that uh, what's what's really mind blowing is if you think of live migration, most of the people think of clusters. And Microsoft can do that uh, from Windows Server 2008 R2 ongoing. But with Windows Server 2012, and 2012 is nearly out of support, so it's already 10 years, we can also do live migration be be between Hyper-V standalone hosts. So uh, yep. you can move a VM from one standalone host where the, where the VM is on, on local storage to another standalone host where we also have local storage. Of course, you have to, to take your data with you, the data of the VM, but this is mind-blowing. So for, for getting a VM from a single a node into a cluster or from a cluster to another cluster, there are endless possibilities for live migration. And as you said, your your VM is running, so your service is always up. But okay, what's more? <laughs> exactly, we'll keep going on here. So, and we don't. Uh, sorry, we don't have to uh, the time to go all 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 of the steps that are in the module. So uh, there is additional information in the module. We are skipping uh, a lot of things here, right? <laughs> Right, right. Yeah, I wish we could go into every I wish we had time to go into every little detail, yeah. but uh, we'll, we'll continue on here. So we're kind of talking about what Hyper-V is, what it can do. Let's talk about system requirements really quick here. And really, the key pieces that are required to run Hyper-V on top of a piece of physical hardware is you need a 64 bit processor with second level address translation. Um, you need uh, the virtualization technology from a a CPU. So if you're on the Intel side, you need Intel VT, or if you're running an AMD processor inside of your physical host, you need AMD V. AMD -V. Um, these are features that you may have to go into the BIOS of the system and enable. I think it's been a while since I've had to do this. But I think most uh, manufacturers are enabling these by default these days. Yeah. I, you probably know that more than I do, Karsten. But yeah, um, on servers, they are always enabled. And yeah. I think also on a work workstations and notebooks they are enabled nowadays it's been a while since i've had to go and flick it on so i think uh yeah that should be set out of the box for the most part but just something to double check um you also need sufficient memory for the host and guest virtual machines so how much memory depends on your particular use case uh and then you also need uh data ex data execution prevention enabled um and again depending on your processor that may be intel xd or AMD NX inside mm -hmm. of your BIOS. Um, now, if you just want a real quick uh, quick and dirty method to figure out if the system meets the requirements, you can use systeminfo.exe from the command line, and it'll give you that information. Uh, in terms of nested virtualization, there's a couple of things that you need to be aware of. So for nested virtualization to work, you need to be running uh, Windows Server 2016 or Windows Server 2019 or Windows Server 2022 as well. Um, the functionality is also available on Azure Stack HCI, and that's for both the host and the guest operating system. So key piece to, to keep in mind there. Um, so again, kind of the same things that we talked about earlier. You need those uh, virtual machine extensions enabled. You need extended page table ca capabilities in the physical host. And then on the guest VM itself, so you have your host ready. You're running Hyper-V on top of the host. You have a virtual machine that you want to run a hypervisor inside of. Um, in Windows Admin Center, there's actually a graphical UI to enable the virtualization extensions for the virtual machine. Or you can set it from PowerShell by using the set VM processor commandlet here um, and expose those virtualization extensions. Again, that's for the guest operating system. Uh, in order to install the Hyper-V server role, um, you can use Windows Admin Center, Server Manager, the typical tools that you would use to install roles on Windows Server, or you can use the Install Windows feature, PowerShell commandlet as well. So, so time for a knowledge, knowledge check, right? Check. That's right, that's right. And the first knowledge check we have here, you can scan the QR code to go and uh, answer this question. Um, and we'll give you a couple of minutes to do this. But the first question here is, which the following is not required to implement Hyper-V on a physical server? Keyword here, not required yeah. words. Keyword not required. Right. <laughs> so the, the other two are required, right? Um, you can only yeah. choose one of those. So right. two are required, one is not. And we want to know which is not required. Yep, yep, Let's exactly. See. Let me Give see people. The... 
yeah, we'll give people a couple of minutes here or a couple, probably 30 seconds, probably to take a look at this. But yeah, is it a 64 bit processor with uh, SLAT and VM monitor mode? Is it a uh, guest virtual machine must be running server 2016 or newer? <clears throat> or is it uh, DEP? I'm pretty sure I know which one it is here. I, I think so. <laughs> Again, not required. <laughs> Andy, if, if we both didn't know that, we immediately got uh, rid of our MVP award, right? I, I know, right, right. <laughs> but we're not, I, I'm not temp tempting you which one is right. <laughs> so I guess we'll go ahead and uh, take a look here. And our answer is B. The guest VM must be running Windows Server 2016 or newer. That is not a requirement for yeah. running Hyper-V because you can run it on 2008, 2008 R2, 2012. I remember those days. I, <laughs> so. I even got uh, the DOS virtualized on, on Hyper-V. You have to do some additional steps, uh, but it's it was possible. I don't know if it's still possible, but we can, wait, we can go way back with our virtual machines. They are not That's supported, right. of course, because the operating system is not supported anymore. And you can do Linux, very old Linux, Linuxes yep. and so on. Yep. So the yep. next one. Yeah. So where can an administrator obtain integration services for Windows Server 2019 Hyper-V guest virtual machines? So integration server ser services are those drivers yeah, and, and services that live inside of the guest operating system, right? Yeah, and important is the version, the version here, 2019 and 2016. There was a change in older Hyper-V, uh, another. Another, another answer was correct here, but uh, nowadays it's it's much, much easier. You remember yep. maybe there was I a cap file this. included, right? You had to add something and install something. Um, <laughs> so nowadays it's much, much easier. Um, Definitely. So we'll go ahead and show that. The answer here, of course, is Windows Update. Yeah. So I, rem I remember the days when... Uh, you had to actually load up the installation media, right? And uh, <laughs> well, connect the the integration was services a, ISO, right? Yeah, there was an ISO, right? You had to connect it and then to install it. And and now, because the the uh, integration services in the VM are kernel drivers, uh, and if you install kernel drivers, you have to reboot the system. That's super easy when you do updates anyway, and you get the new versions via update. You have to reboot the system. Uh, anyway, uh, there is one exception to that. There is some something new in Azure where you have hot hot patching, but uh, for the normal virtual machine, for the normal operating system, you have to reboot it, and that's the right place to upgrade those drivers. So let's go on with the next session because we are 35 minutes into our our session here, and we have one module, and this, I know. this was not the biggest one, right? <laughs> I know. You've got, we got a lot to cover in the storage and the uh, the networking section. So this section is, is, is fairly short, but this part, we're focusing specifically on Azure Stack HCI itself. And uh, in the module, you actually hear word of this fictional company, Contosa, right? And if you're uh, a veteran of Microsoft uh, certification exams, I'm sure you've heard of Contosa before. But really, uh, most organizations and businesses, they're trying to provide high availability for those mission critical workloads, right? And that's really what Azure Stack HCI provides. And uh, I wanted to talk about the reasons for using Azure Stack HCI. And I think before we go a little bit further on this, Karsten, there's one, one thing I wanted to cover, and that is um, Azure Stack HCI really is the culmination of all of those on-premises technologies that we've been using to date, right? Um, you're going to talk about storage spaces direct and software-defined networking here shortly. We've talked about Hyper-V already. Um, and I think what I've seen happen, and you probably run into this as well, Karsten, is that um, some people who are really diehard on-prem folks, they may just look at the, the term Azure Stack HCI and just assume that it's, it's some Azure thing, right? Um, yeah. And really... It's like I said, it's all those components that we've been using on premises all along now rebranded into Azure Stack HCI, this cohesive package. And the reason that you might want to use and, and it's running a, at the sites of the user. So the customer. It is. Yep. It's not Definitely. something that is running in Azure. We leverage, we can leverage Azure services, of course, to enrich uh, Azure Stack HCI, but we don't have to. 
Yeah, there's only yep. one thing we have to do. We have to register the cluster in Azure, and you talk about that maybe. Uh, but otherwise, it's my hardware. It's it's standing in my data center in my in in my environment environment and i care about it. something in azure where microsoft cares uh, cares about uh Patrick and so on it's it's still my thing yeah um, yep, and that's important uh, when i talk to people some some assume it's an azure service it's running in an azure data center it's not it's uh it's your on your premises you have to care about it it's your hardware uh and and so on Exactly. Yep. And I, I always like to preface the Azure Stack HCI conversation with that just because, you know, it, that confuses some people. They just assume it's a service running in Azure somewhere, right? And so back to the reasons why you would want to use this, knowing that it's in your data center, you know, you're going to run virtual machines on it, Windows, Linux. Uh, you may want to run some containerization workloads. So you can actually run Azure Kubernetes service on-prem using Azure Stack HCI. Uh, same thing with Azure Virtual Desktop. So these were traditionally born in Azure services that you can now run on-prem using Azure Stack HCI. So let's talk about the components, the different pieces. We've talked about Hyper-V already, but we have a nice graph, a graph, a diagram here on the right-hand side that kind of shows a simple two-node cluster. So you got node one, node two. These are kind of your physical servers, right? Uh, these are the physical servers inside of your cluster. Uh, and then down at the bottom, you've got that clustered storage pool. Now, Karsten's going to talk more about storage spaces direct here in a, in a second. But basically, Azure Stack HCI is leveraging the uh, in-chassis storage on each of those nodes and clustering it across the two using these dedicated networks you see in the center of the diagram here. So across these dedicated networks, you've got cluster traffic and you've got storage traffic east and west between the two nodes. And then on the outside piece of the diagram here. That is basically your, your production network, right? How are your clients connecting to the workloads that are being hosted by Azure Stack HCI? That's what this network does. Um, and we'll talk about that a little bit more in the uh, software defined networking section uh, later in the module. Now, I'm not gonna go through everything on this slide. There's a lot of text I know, but really uh, the one key piece I wanted to talk about here is in the nodes section and um, you know, failover clustering is the service that Azure Stack HCI uses for high availability between all the physical nodes in the environment. And failover clustering itself can support up to 64 nodes. But the really key piece to remember here, when we're talking about Azure Stack HCI specifically, is it only supports up to 16 nodes in a cluster. So important bit there. Um, in terms of number of virtual machines, Azure Stack HCI, a cluster can host up to 8,000 guest VMs. Um, you can run up to a thousand virtual machines on a single host, assuming your hardware can handle it, right? A um, couple of other key pieces here I kind of mentioned already. You got your clients that are connect to your uh, services that are running on top of Azure Stack HCI. You got all your various networks, your storage network, your cluster network, your production network, a lot of different networks, right? Uh, Kirsten will be talking about that here shortly. Um, the other key bit that I wanted to mention here and the second uh, component of Azure Stack HCI is the clustered virtual machine role. And, and I found, Karsten, maybe you've run into this as well. I found that this, this terminology kind of confuses some people because yeah. failover clustering as a service in Windows Server and on top of Azure Stack HCI refers to a, a service that it's, it's hosting in a highly available fashion as a clustered role. And uh, a virtual machine is no different. So when I want to run a virtual machine in a failover cluster um, in a highly available fashion, Windows uh, failover clustering in Azure Stack HCI sees it as a clustered virtual machine role. Mm -hmm. um, so that's kind of the key terminology to keep in mind there. Yeah, to add here, um, you can run a virtual machines in a cluster on the nodes on the high available storage without putting them in the cluster. Yep. Yeah, and there are rare use cases for that. But then the cluster is not aware of this uh, virtual machine. So if it, if it moves VMs from one host to another because you shut down the host, it, it is not aware of this virtual machine because it's not the clustered virtual machine role and it doesn't move it. Yeah? Um, so uh, it's important that your virtual machines are clustered roles, but uh, the concept is, is a bit a bit shaky yeah right okay sorry <laughs> yeah no no worries no it's good insight definitely 
So a couple of other things here to cover is uh, resources. So res you might have other resources other than virtual machines inside of your uh, inside of your cluster. So that'd be things like networking, storage, um, cluster storage. So any highly available storage, or in the case of Azure Stack HCI, you have storage spaces direct as well, which Carson will be talking about a little bit more here shortly. And then the final thing that we wanted to cover as part of uh, the introduction to Azure Stack HCI is the concept of quorum. So quorum basically represents the number of components inside of a cluster that have to be available for the cluster to be online. And really the core thing to keep in mind with Quorum is um, basically, you, I always explain it through the terms of a two node cluster. So I've got two nodes inside of a cluster. They're working together to host virtual machines. Now, completely ignoring quorum for a second, you could run into a situation where um, one node thinks it's the only node online and the other node thinks it's the only node online. And they're both like, whoa, hey, my buddy is gone. I need to bring up all these virtual machines to keep yeah. everything up and running. And now you have the same virtual machine running on two different machines and it's a whole thing, right? What quorum does is we add what's called a quorum witness to the cluster, kind of a, a third component that has a vote in whether or not the cluster is online. And that helps prevent these kind of split brain situations, right? That I just kind of described. And um, what you can do with quorum, what types of witnesses that you can use to kind of act as this, this third vote are things like file share witnesses or a cloud witness. So a, sh a file share witness is basically something that you can figure inside of failover clustering that says, hey, I want to use this, this external file share somewhere um, to act as a vote in my cluster quorum. So this could be, um, you know, a, on a, a file, sh a Windows file share somewhere in my lab downstairs. I'm actually using a uh, an SMB share off of a uh, a Netgear Ready NAS device that acts as my file share witness for my cluster. Um, the key bit here is you want to make sure that that file share exists somewhere outside of the cluster. You don't want it living in the cluster because then if the cluster has issues, it can't reach the, the file share. So yeah, you want to keep your file share outside of the cluster somewhere. Your other option here is using a cloud witness inside of an Azure storage account. And this is a great option. The only thing that I always suggest people do in production use cases, if you're going to use a cloud witness, you're probably already utilizing Azure cloud services in some way, shape, or form. And if you're going to depend on a cloud witness for your cluster quorum, you probably want to have redundant internet connections of some way, shape, or form, right? Mm -hmm. um, Carson, I'm sure you've run into that yourself, right? Yeah, especially I'm. Uh, it's not. It's not in the focus of of this uh, of this presentation. But uh, there's one great feature called stretch cluster in Azure Stack HCI. And if you have yep. a stretch cluster, it's so important that you have redundant internet connections to your uh, to your witness. So now it's uh, knowledge check time again. Right? It is. It is. So what's the question, Andy? So the question we've got here is, what is the maximum number of nodes supported by Azure Stack HCI? And it was funny, when I was going through this, when I was going through this, my knee-jerk reaction was to say one thing, and it was actually another. And you probably know what, uh, <laughs> what, what I did here with that. Now, we'll give folks about... We are not asking about the maximum numbers of Hyper-V nodes in a Hyper-V cluster. It's especially about Azure Stack HCI nodes, right. and that's quite different so give the people another 30 seconds maybe if, uh, to vote to to yeah. uh, scan the code here or uh, go to the poll and then we uh, we will give you the right answer yeah, yeah exactly it was it was so funny because you know i'm just like oh that's easy i know that and i and then i hit next <laughs> when i was going through the slide deck and i'm like oh oh wait <laughs> I, I had that was one question that i cover and that's uh that's was a bit weird uh, so yeah maybe you blend in the the right answer so it is yeah, 16. It's, it's so 16. i did the whole thing where um I'm like, oh, yeah, I can do 64 nodes in a failover cluster. No, we're talking about Azure Stack HCI, which is 16 nodes. Yep, 16 <laughs> nodes. 
Flo is uh, Flo. Uh, our moderator is adding something. He said uh, he remembered where Carsten and Bernard, uh, a Microsoft employee, built the, the world's largest Hyper-V cluster out of notebooks. I think it was 55 notebooks in a Hyper-V cluster. <laughs> what, this was what the great ta times where we where we had some IT cams. It was called in the days where we showed the great Microsoft technologies two people in a one day uh, one day uh, event so but let's go to the next question it's about the quorum uh, it is yes so which what, what's weird here uh, quorum and witness right uh, people always get this wrong witness is another another um, another vote uh, and quorum is if the uh, if you have more more votes so a cluster has to have quorum so yep. more votes are online than offline right Correct. Yeah. So which quorum witness can an administrator implement by using the USB drive and Azure Stack HCI failover clustering? So disk witness, cloud witness, or file share witness? And this is a tricky one because is. a USB drive, drive, um, it's not obvious here. So if you think drive like disk, mm, you may be wrong. So <laughs> I'm going to give it 10 seconds here. But yeah, and that's... And you didn't mention the disk witness. I was thinking, should I add a disk witness to the two witnesses you were talking about with Azure Stack HCI? Uh, so disk witness was not mentioned there, and that's for a reason. So what is the correct answer, Andy? So our correct witness, our co correct answer is file <laughs> share witness. Because, yeah, you're thinking USB drive, like, hey, I have this disk, I'm going to plug it in, and it's a disk witness, right? Well, that's, yeah. that's something else in failover clustering. In Azure Stack yeah. HCI, we can use a file share witness, so you could utilize and, a, a USB drive in that fashion. And, uh, and the cloud witness, the disk witness is not supported. It's only for a cluster with uh, SAN storage, and that's yep. maybe a segue to to my presentation it because is. now now uh, i will cover uh more of the presentation so let me see yes it works so it um, does it does now we are talking in in this part and i will lead this part and andy will chime in with uh, useful information we will talk about uh, software defined storage and software defined storage what is it um so in the old days, let's say old days of virtualization, and that, that doesn't mean you can't do that anymore today. But in the old days, we had uh, when we had a Hyper-V cluster, we had a SAN storage. So an, an external storage system that has network connections like Ethernet connections uh, with iSCSI, you can use that, or uh, fiber channel connections. And every Hyper-V host is, con is connected to this external storage. And you buy a hardware, it's, um, it's a bit of a black box concept. You don't know how everything works internally. Uh, and uh, we have multiple vendors, and this is a good solution. But nowadays, software-defined storage means we have our servers with internal drives that Andy mentioned already. So you have additional drives in your servers. Can be a number of them. Can be four additional drives. We need at least and up to, uh, let's say, uh, 40, 50, 60. I have even seen storage basis direct implementation certified systems with 100 drives per node yeah and then we use those drives to build a high available storage solution so we don't need external storage we have everything we need in our azure stack hci nodes um, so um, let me see this is not a uh, so we, we talk about software defined storage here there are multiple parts that uh, we uh, we need for that um, we use storage virtualization, so we don't have a hardware storage system. We we use uh, storage virtualization to separate our storage management uh, and presentation from the underlying physical hardware. And uh, it will be a little bit clearer if we go through the uh, through the presentation. Um, Software-defined storage uh, implement virtual workloads no longer requiring configurations like uh, LANs. Uh, if you have a SAN storage system, you usually present a LANs, logical, uh, um, logical um, volumes or physical volumes to your host and your virtual machines live in those, uh, in those LANs. And you have to uh, present 
uh, every LAN to every Hyper-V node. So let me let me uh, let me uh, quick draw a bit. We have a SAN system here, and then uh, we, you create your LAN. And let's say we have two Hyper-V nodes, and then the Hyper-V nodes are connected to our SAN system directly or over a, 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 um, um, a network, a storage network, and then our VMs live here, and uh, the data is here in our uh, LAN. Uh, if we look at software-defined networking on the next slide, um, we can use storage spaces, and storage spaces was introduced in, with Windows Server 2012, so it's not a new concept. It is in 2012, 2012 R2, 2016, 2019, and now in Azure Stack HCI, and also in 2022, Server 2022. So in essence, you have your local drives. If we look at a single node, let's say we have a single node, you have local drives in there you have you have your c drive for example and then you have additional drives here and instead of using a rate controller to to create a high available storage so in in the meaning of that if one drive fails your data is still there you don't use a rate controller you use software software defined storage spaces to say this is a uh, a storage pool, so all the disks get into a storage pool. And then we can carve out of the storage pool virtual disks. And our operating system sees these virtual disks. We can create partitions on them. We can, can create volumes on them. And the data in the virtual disk is spread over these physical disks. So we can have a mirror. We can have other types of resiliency like parity, or we can even have a mixed a mixed thing between mirror and parity and so on. So storage, a storage pool, we, we put all our disks in a storage pool and then we can uh, create out of the storage pool our spaces and our virtual disks here. And we can have multiple. So we can have one virtual disk with a mirror, for example, is a two-way mirror. So the data is on always two times on our disks, uh, but not on the same disk. It's also using different disks for the two uh, copies of the data. So we can leverage the performance of all four drives, not only two for a mirror. A RAID controller would use only two of them with a RAID 1, for example. And we can do parity. In this example with four disks, we can do uh, double parity. So uh, two-way, no, not two-way mirror. It's a double parity. Sorry, double parity. So then the data is spread over multiple disks. You, you know parity like uh, 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 RAID 5 or RAID 6. They have parity information on different uh, disks. So let's go to the next one. Why should you use storage spaces? Uh, usually, uh, in Germany at least, everybody thinks uh, if they have single server, they think RAID control by default. RAID control, yep. right, Andy? You have the yes. same, right? Yep, same uh, over here, yep. Yeah. If I talk to people about storage spaces, even in a single node, they think, why? I have my RAID controller and it works for let's say 15 years and it's great. Yeah, it's great, but storage spaces is even better because we have some great features here. I talked about already about the uh, increasing storage resiliency level. We can have a mirror, we can have a three-way mirror. Yeah, so we have three copies on three different disks. I haven't I haven't seen that with a RAID controller, uh, to be honest. Maybe there are RAID controllers out there that can do that. We can do parity, okay, but we can also um, have virtual disks that uh, that do both that do a, a part of the virtual disk is a mirror and a part is a double parity or a parity why should you do that you you ask why why go uh, go this concept because the mirror is very fast for writing but it has not the best efficiency right you uh, with a three-way mirror you have only 33 percent uh, of your disks you can use for, for data. So if you need a 10 terabyte volume, you have to have 30 terabytes of, uh, of devices. And with parity, you have a better use of your, of your uh, better efficiency uh, 
for double parity, it's 50% uh, with four drives and it's getting better with more drives. Or if you do single parity, like RAID 5, it's even better. It's, uh, it's with, with three drives, you have 66%. With four drives, you have 75%. So doing this multi-resilient storage space volume, you have a fast landing zone for writing. And, but you have also a zone for your cold data where you, where you have a much, much larger space. So we can do something like tiering even in a single server. Yeah. So the, the, the Windows server or Azure Stack HCI writes the data into the fast tier. And then it moves, if there is not enough space anymore, it moves it to the other, uh, other tier. So this improves our storage performance. That's uh, really great. And we can have different types of drives. We can leverage SSDs. SSDs and NVMEs, very fast storage, but they are, of course, uh, a little bit more expensive than hard drives. Uh, so we can have SSDs for our fast storage and we can have HDDs for our slow storage. And we can all do that uh, with storage spaces and even do this mirror accelerated parity. So we have so much options here to design the right, the right storage uh, for our needs. Yeah. So I, I love storage spaces. And if we go storage spaces in a cluster in um, for storage spaces direct, it's even better. So uh, improving storage performance, I already talked about that. Increasing storage efficiency, uh, uh, um, I talked about that. And there is another feature, it's SYN provisioning. So in storage spaces, you can also use SYN provisioning. You said, you say, I want to have a five terabyte volume. Uh, but it shouldn't it shouldn't uh, use all the space I need for the five terabytes. So imagine five terabytes, two-way mirror, we have 10 terabytes. So 10 terabytes are gone. But if we use SYN provisioning, only the data you put into the volume is used. So you have a lot of space left there. You can create your five terabyte volume, but it will only use maybe some hundred uh, gigabytes because the data you put into the volume only uses uh, some hundred uh, gigabytes. And then if you delete something, it will be freed uh, uh, when, uh, because it used the trim feature. So this is great if you, if you don't know how much storage you really need in the end, uh, how much VMs you put on the storage. Uh, so you don't have to buy all the storage up front. You, uh, you can leverage thin provisioning, do bigger volumes. And then if you need more space, you can, of course, add drives, uh, uh, SSDs, NVMEs, whatever afterwards. Yeah? Yeah, the only thing you got to watch out with uh, the thin provisioning, right, is you don't over provision your store. I mean, you can over provision using thin yeah. provisioning. You just want to make sure you don't actually run out of disk space, right? You got to keep a close eye on the dis disk space utilization. I, I, ask me how I know sometime. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I think Andy, you you uh, you you gone down this rabbit hole, right? I have done it, and there there are so many layers. If you look at SAN storage, there is deduplication and everything. We have that in Windows too. We have SYN provisioning. Then we have with our virtual machines, you have uh, uh, dynamic uh, uh, or um, yeah, dynamic uh, virtual disks. They can increase. Yep. Then you yep. have uh, sometimes using people deduplication inside the VMs, so you have multiple layers where you can uh, run out of this space right so you have yep. to monitor it you're, yeah. absolutely you're absolutely correct this is uh this is a danger when we not uh when we not uh you when we use something like that it's a danger that you over provision all your stuff yeah? yep. another concept we need so storage spaces uh we talked about you can do that with single nodes you can do it uh it's 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 a base technology we use in Azure Stack HCI, but Azure Stack HCI is not single node. We we need at least two nodes. We need a cluster for that. We, you talked about the concept a bit. So uh, uh, storage spaces is for both. But if we present storage in a, in a Hyper-V cluster, and Azure Stack HCI is in essence also a Hyper-V cluster, we uh, we want that our virtual machines can run on different nodes and always connect to the storage. So we need something that are not local disks, local presentations of the storage. We need something where the storage is presented to every node in our cluster. And Microsoft for that uh, uses 
cluster shared volumes. And cluster shared volumes are important because the file systems we use uh, in a Microsoft environment is NTFS or with Azure Stack HCI, we use ReFS. And um, these file systems are not per se cluster file systems. So if different virtual machines or different nodes write into the same file system, and it's not a cluster aware file system, it can happen that um, the nodes change the metadata because they extend a file or something. And then the metadata is overwritten uh, uh, by the nodes. One node changes, the other node changes the metadata and something is lost in the process. So we need a cluster file system. And in the Microsoft space, cluster shared volume are those. So we have one owner node who is responsible for all the metadata changes in our volume, but every other node can also write into the volume and uh, read from the volume. But if there is an operation that uh, requires a metadata update or change, the owner will do it uh, for the other nodes. So a cluster shared volume is a cluster file system we need for our uh, high available virtual machines. Yeah? And uh, we, um, the reasons for that I already mentioned, if we want to cluster Hyper-V VMs, we need a cluster, uh, uh, cluster shared uh, volume. Um, and there is a other concept, a scale out file share hosting application for data uh, assess accessible through SMB3 uh, and in, in essence, the scale out file server. This is an option we have with Windows Server. We can do storage spaces direct uh, with a scale out file server, but it's not an option in Azure Stack HCI. Scale out file server is only available in storage spaces direct, but not in Azure Stack HCI. Yeah? Microsoft has a great um, network protocol for file access. It's called uh, SMB. You heard of that already. Uh, most of the people heard of it and they use it on a daily basis. It's uh, called server message block, SMB. And in Windows Server 2012, Microsoft introduced SMB 3. So SMB has a long history in the Microsoft um, ecosystem. So for example, uh, with Windows Server 2012, we got introduced to SMB3. With it, SMB3 has all the great features we, we need uh, for using virtual machines on shares so that the data of a virtual machine is uh, living on a share. Yeah? Um, before that, we couldn't do that. There was SMB 2.1 in uh, Windows Server 2008. This is not supported, by the way. So every supported Microsoft operating system uh, talks or uh, can leverage SMB 3.0 and beyond. But uh, there are, of course, other operating systems, uh, and we have a long history in Microsoft, going back to Windows for Work 3.0. 11 this was in 1993 so in the the last is it millennia <laughs> i don't get the word <laughs> correctly but uh, the history uh, is is far back when uh, smb started it, it was not called smb there but the roots are there nowadays we use smb 3.1.1 and had uh, and smb 3 has some great features that are especially useful for uh, hyper v virtual machines so let's talk about uh, some reasons why we should use smb3 and of course andy i think you you use smb3 a lot or oh yeah i mean if if you know you use hyper v these days you're using smb it's it's you know i when you were talking about sans earlier um and the way that we used to do things in the data center right where you'd carve off a lun and then you'd uh, provide access to that lun across your storage network whether it was iSCSI or fiber channel um I, I think about how we do things today with Azure Stack HCI and uh, failover clustering versus then um, and storage spaces direct today. Uh, it seemed a lot more complicated back then than it does now, right? So, I mean, leveraging yeah. SMB for our cluster storage today is so much easier than it was managing a storage fabric back in the day, right? Just my opinion. Yeah. 
what what I think when I talk to a lot of people about uh, SMB, they always think client servers. So Windows right. 10 and the file server, but SMB can do so much more. And, have, and, and it's all the great new features are are for uh, Hyper-V uh, and uh, using high available storage, for example. We have more than Hyper-V over SMB. This is for me, of course, this is the main the main um, usage for SMB3, of course, but uh, we also can do SQL uh, over SMB. Yep. So imagine you have a SQL uh, cluster, for example, and you want to put your SQL databases on a on a central high available storage system. Um, this is not... Uh, this is not the main scenario for SMB high availability today. There is a SQL uh, HA, so always on. You have your data on every SQL server and you have a kind of replication. But there are also customers who want to store their SQL databases on a on a, on a a high available storage system. And for that, we have also a Microsoft SQL server over SMB. But uh, the main case really for SMB3 is Hyper-V. Uh, over SMB3. And there are some, some amazing features in SMB3. We, 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 I think no other storage, uh, storage protocol has today. And SMB has it quite for 10 years. No, yeah. not for 10 years. Yes, for 10 years. Uh, for example, SMB multi-channel. This is really a big one. Yeah. Uh, no, I don't think any other storage protocol can do that without the help of external features. So what is SMB multi-channel? Um, it is redundancy. So if we have multiple paths between an SMB client, I think Hyper-V host, and an SMB server, let's think scale out file server where our VMs are living, if we have multiple network cards, SMB multi-channel will automatically detect those, those uh, network cards and use them. Yeah? And we don't have to configure teaming. So LBFO teaming to, to, make, uh, to create one virtual card. We don't have to configure MPIO. These are the external uh, helpers I, I, I was meaning when I said uh, SMB multi-channel don't need them. Of course, you can use a fiber channel or iSCSI and use MPIO to leverage multiple passes between the, your, your server and your storage. But in, with SMB multi-channel, it's built in and it's, yeah. it's, it's done automatically. I love the word automatic. Magic, magically, it it really works magically. It the protocol finds the redundant uh, ways to the to the server and use them. And then, if you lose one connection, if you have multiple, you can lose one. There is there is redundancy built in by default, so uh, nothing will happen to your workload uh, uh, unless you have one connection left. Yeah. Um, so we have our network fault tolerance. We have our multiple usage of the ways and even if you have only one network card between the nodes yeah and uh, you have a system with many cores when you do smb3 over tcp ip older smp smb implementations up to 2.1 only leveraged one core to put the data between the nodes you so you can leverage only one core yeah but one core can't do 25 gigabit of data movement. It can honestly can do maybe five, six gigabit. And then it's, it, it's, it's, it can't do more yeah? we, because we have cores on both sides. So multi-channel, even if you have one 10 gigabit card or one 25 gigabit card, it will open multiple connections between the nodes and leverage multiple cores on the sender and the receiver to get your data between the two hosts. And that's amazing. Uh, it's really amazing. I'm, I'm still amazed about the possibilities with SMB multi-channel. I have a video about that, uh, but I, I can't show it now because we don't have the time for that. Uh, speaking of time, uh, yeah, let's, let's go on with our presentation. So um, scale out file server, I mentioned it. One scenario for storage basis direct is a scale out file server. And this is this part of uh, the slide here. So we have four nodes here with internal storage. You see here, there are four disks in this node, in every node. And 
we can build a high available scale out file server. So our virtual machines that are running on a separate cluster. So we have two clusters here. We have one Hyper-V cluster and we have one uh, scale out file server cluster leveraging storage spaces. So two clusters here and the VMs are running in this cluster and they leverage S the SMB3 protocol with all the cool stuff. Uh, SMB Direct, I, I skipped over SMB Direct, so I will go back a slide uh, uh, in a minute. Uh, SMB Direct, SMB multi-channel to connect to the nodes here. Yeah? And uh, this is really amazing. So this is... Uh, this aggregated model or a converged model, this is not available in Azure Stack HCI, but with a Windows server, you can do a storage basis direct cluster and uh, offer this as high available storage for your VM workload. And uh, let's look at, I thought I added something here, but it's gone. So SMB direct, what is, what is SMB direct? I mentioned with SMB multi-channel, we leverage we leverage TCP IP for SMB3 to, to uh, transport our data to the other side. And we need, we need CPU performance for that. We need a lot of CPU. If we have, imagine, 25 or 225 gigabit connections or even more. I have in my, uh, in my uh, company, we have 100 gigabit switches and I have some 100 gigabit cards. So Im imagine you would do that with SMB3 over, uh, over TCP IP. If one core can move five gigabits of data and you want to leverage 100 gigabit, you would need 20 cores to move the data between the, the, the two nodes. So on every node, 20 cores. And you, you, you would say, Carsten, are you crazy? 20 <laughs> cores to move the data? Is there not something else? Yes, there is something else. SMB Direct. So SMB Direct, we have our memory. We have our kernel here with the TCP IP stack, yeah, and then we have our network card. So if we if we move, and here we have the same, of course, if we move data from one node to another, to the memory, we go through the kernel. There we use the cores. Then we go over the network and go again through the kernel and and use all the CPU power to move the data. So if we have RDMA cards, so let's get rid of wrong, let's get of, rid of these lines. So if we have RDMA enabled cards, RDMA enabled cards, and uh, SMB Direct is SMB3 over RDMA, RDMA. In essence, the network card uses DMA, direct memory access, to grab the data out of the memory transfer it over to the other card and put it directly into the memory without going through the kernel and without using CPU. And that, that is something that has Microsoft implemented till Windows Server 2012. Other vendors are now uh, uh, adopting RDMA for their operating systems, but Microsoft has it now for 10 years and they are really good at, with it. So if you have the opportunity, leverage SMB Direct in your clusters. So reason for scale out file server and see we have just 14 minutes left, so I will speed up a bit. We got um, networking to cover yet. Yes, yeah, <laughs> you're right. So uh, scale out file server, it's it's not it's not available in Azure Stack HCI. So to to get our whole content cover, I uh, I would say uh, read for scale out file server in in the in the documentation, and I will skip. Uh, the part. Uh, I will add this guest clustering. What is guest clustering? So if we have an Azure Stack HCI cluster having VMs there and you want to have a high available application running in VMs, for example, um, let's say Exchange. Yeah, There are still some uh, people that don't uh, leverage Office 365. They have still for some reason Exchange Server on premises, but they want to have a high available exchange server. So that's it's, uh, the exchange, how you call it, uh, DAC, uh, so DAG. So we have two exchange servers or more uh, running on different nodes and they they uh, copy the data over to, to another node. That would be uh, one, uh, one um, scenario for a guest cluster. There are other guest cluster scenarios, for example, putting a scale out file server 
as a guest cluster onto an Azure Stack HCI cluster. Why should you do that? Why should you put a high available file server, scale out file server into an Azure Stack HCI cluster? Because you want to have, for example, you mentioned AVD or VDI scenarios, virtual desktop infrastructure scenarios. And Microsoft has a possibility to put our profiles, the user profiles into virtual disks. So it's called user profile disks. And to store those user profile disks that they are um, available on different VDI uh, VMs, yeah, uh, that you always find your own environment with your profile, with all your data in it, uh, you have to store it somewhere central. And it would be nice if it's not gone, if a, if a failure with the server happens. So a high available scale out file server for user profile. I do that. Uh, I have done that often in, at customer installations. So then you can have a guest cluster, a scale out file server. Yeah, let's say we have our Azure Stack HCI cluster here, our nodes, and then we have VMs on it. And this is as of, um, this is uh, this is our file server one. This is our file server VM two. Yeah, S two. Let's say this is S one. So these are virtual machines running on the hardware. Yeah, and then we have our virtual disks here, and we can build a high available scale out file server that is used for our user profile disks. But now we have to, uh, we don't want these two VMs running on the same hardware node. Yeah. Um, for that, we have affinity rules in uh, Azure Stack HCI, but we don't have the time for that. But there are reasons why you want to put a guest cluster into a hardware cluster. And a scale out file server is one of those. So this is an example about uh, storage spaces direct. Uh, um, um, here you see we have our storage pools. We talked about our storage pools. We have our storage, uh, sto software storage bars. We have our nodes here. We have a high performance Ethernet, uh, preferable with RDMA. So we can the, con uh, the nodes can communicate between each other, leveraging SMB direct. And then we have our virtual machines running on a storage space on our CSVs, preferable with ReFS. Uh, and there are the VMs, the data of the VMs is there. So this is quite a lot to take in, of course, uh, but uh, it, it is clearer if you if you follow the other the other sessions that are coming up uh, in, in future uh, um, modules. Yeah? Hyper-V workload model on storage basis direct. Uh, this, aggregated, this, as, this aggregated, this is basically if you have a separate Hyper-V cluster and a separate scale out file server cluster. So we have two clusters. And there is another model, hyper converge, uh, hyper converge model, if our VMs are directly running in our storage cluster. So we have both the virtual machines and the storage in the same cluster. That's hyper converged. And the hyperconverged is the model that Azure Stack HCI, HCI is hyperconverged infrastructure. So this model uh, is what we use with Azure Stack HCI. Yeah. So here we have it. Azure Stack HCI only uses the hyperconverged model. Here's storage replica. We have another great storage feature. And I, I knew I wouldn't have enough time for all these uh, great features. So storage replica, in essence, uh, these are the wrong pictures here. This uh, these are my RDMA pictures. I put it in the wrong slide. So this is live, of course. So storage replica is a possibility. If you have one node with your data and uh, you want to have the data in another site because of uh, redundancy disaster recovery features. So we, we can use storage replica. Uh, we have our VM here. It is writing data in our, in our uh, volume. And with storage replica, every change is synced to uh, this other volume. Here. So we can have a synchronous replication. Every write that is done here is uh, moved over and then it's acknowledged. And then the VM uh, knows the data is on the other side. So we have a synchronous replication, but there's also um, 
a, a possibility to have an asynchronous replication if the if the sites are very far apart let's let's say 100 200 300 kilometers or even miles uh, you can have asynchronous replication so we don't wait for the acknowledgement of the other side it's still an ongoing replication and the synchronous is if the sites are more together maybe on the same uh, same campus for example yeah? and in azure stack hci we can have a stretch cluster that is a leveraging storage replica to replicate the data on the other side so now I have to speed up. Uh, we skip the knowledge check. You have the knowledge check in the module and we go directly to the last module. Yeah, for the sake of time, because there's a lot <laughs> of good networking stuff to talk about. I mean, we could do an entire session just on the storage technologies. I There's so much to talk about in, in storage and Azure Stack HCI and Windows yeah. Server in general, but uh, we sadly don't have the time today. Yeah, and in my course, I have a five-day course about the Azure Stack HCI. It, it takes me a day for all the storage possibilities, yeah. even more. So uh, let's it. let's go to our last uh, module. It's a software-defined networking. Software-defined networking, we leverage software-defined networking in Azure Stack HCI. There are different kinds of software-defined networking. There is the whole concept we use in Azure. In Azure, we have millions of users on the in the same data center, on the same networks, and um, you have to separate those users from each other so that they can't communicate. The VM of one user can't communicate with another user. In smaller environments, uh, we use uh, the VLAN uh, or the yeah, VLAN technology where you have diff different VLANs. And if you don't know what a VLAN is, uh, uh, look it up. Uh, uh, so it's in essence a possibility to put your put your um, uh, create virtual networks on an Ethernet. So you create virtual Ethernet networks, and only the 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 users in the same VLAN can communicate with another. So you you create a kind of isolation and software defined networking uh, that we use that we can use in uh, in Azure Stack HCI is uh, uh, is this separating uh, on a on not on the switch levels. It's in a software level. Yeah. So what is uh, we have network extract abstraction with a software defined network uh, networking. So uh, we don't have separate switches for every user. Uh, we use the same Ethernet technology, but on top of that, we encapsulate our Ethernet packets from the user uh, again in in Ethernet packets, and uh, we we encrypt them so we have really a network abstraction. We can leverage network policies. We can uh, like uh, firewall rules. We can say which user can or which VM can communicate which with other VM on that level. We can do rules there and so on. And then we have our network management. Uh, uh, we can do uh, create everything here with PowerShell, but not every IT pro loves PowerShell. So we also have the possibility to do software defined network and create the rules there, implement software defined network and everything with Windows Admin Center. And Microsoft honestly did a great job in Windows Admin Center to, to address the software defined network parts because they're a bit a bit um, more complex than uh, the normal Ethernet. You have additional layers. Yeah? And in Windows Admin Center, you can even debug um, software defined network. So you have the possibility to uh, to uh, filter for packets uh, so that you see the flow of the data. SDN used right. to be really complex to manage. And I, yeah, Windows Admin Center did a fantastic job of simplifying that. That's that's so true. So uh, very good job. So what are the prime and components of software defined networking? We have, of course, Hyper-V network virtualization. We need Hyper-V for that. We need the the Hyper-V switch to add this additional layer. Uh, um, and then for encapsulation, Microsoft first went with the a network virtualization, generic routing encapsulation, NVGRE. But nowadays, you can still leverage that uh, because old implementation of SDN use that. But nowadays, we use uh, virtual extensible LAN, VXLAN. It's it's a kind of industry standard. Many other vendors also uses uh, uh, or leverage VXLAN. So Microsoft decided to go that way. And... Uh, um, 
and um, um, we, we, in essence, we have our layer two Ethernet and another layer two Ethernet. Yeah? Then we need the set switch. The set switch is the new Hyper-V switch. I always say Windows, in, uh, Microsoft introduced the set switch, switch embedded theming with Windows Server 2016. Uh, so don't use the old Hyper-V switch, use the newer set switch. And we need an instance, uh, a brain who knows which packet is uh, encapsulated in which Ethernet frame, because we have these additional layer with encryption. So we need our network controller. And to be honest, we need more than one network controller, because if your network controller is gone, nobody knows where the packets are. So we need a network in, uh, network controller cluster, usually three uh, to five nodes. So, and this is uh, the primary con, con we, we could talk, talk more about SDN, but we are running out of time. So let's uh, wrap up the session here. I skip again the question. There are some great questions here, but I, I run through the, through the uh, slides. So uh, let's um, go to the last slide. Uh, where are we here? Last slide. Well, let's just skip those. A summary. We talked about a lot in this uh, module. We, did. we described Hyper-V and its components uh, that you did it in, in essence. We described uh, the Azure Stack HCI and its components. Then I talked about software-defined storage. A lot to talk about that. And uh, uh, the last module was a... Uh, run through and I, uh, uh, emphasis on run through uh, software defined <laughs> networking. So a lot um, of, a lot of info in a short period of time, definitely. So, yeah. So if you want to learn more, here is a, a link for the summary of the module. And uh, there are um, here again, you see where you can learn more. And the last slide I have for you the next uh, upcoming session so the next one is uh introducing to azure arc enabled service uh, uh on uh yeah this afternoon our this afternoon our time or, or in the us it's in the morning more suitable to you uh, andy right it is it is yeah so 11 30 pacific time so yeah that'd be evening for you in the eu i believe so definitely a great session there with azure arc azure arc is super cool so if you can check that one out definitely highly suggest you do more information on the qr codes there so well with that carson i think that's uh that's about it for us we're we're wrapped up so thanks everyone for watching and Thanks, Carson, for uh, for being on, and we hope to catch you again sometime soon. Thanks, Andy. Thanks, Lauren. Bye.